This is episode 21 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. I really do appreciate uh, the couple of you that have given reviews. I, I'm, yeah, I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. If you have been listening this far, please uh, consider giving a review. I hear that it helps other people find the podcast. But better than that, share it with a friend. Put it on social media. That's even even better. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 49. Hunting Meat. Fall, 2016. The whiteness of the birch trees contrasted against the pines, which looked all the darker for the magenta and orange streaking across the sky, presaging the dawn. As the light grew, the swamp grass around the pond glistened with frost. Beaver's head broke the stillness of the water, and the V of the wake spread behind it as it swam. As the sun hit the pond, a slight mist rose from the still warm water into the cold air. Chickadees in the branches fluffed their feathers and sank back under their feet. Behind Eric, a red squirrel hopped over the forest floor, stirring up dry leaves in a series of triple jumps. Eric wasn't a ponderer or overprone to deep philosophical thoughts. He was not a stoic. He tended to talk a thing until it was no good. Sitting here at the edge of the pond, though, he couldn't help but think. The pond was the same as last year's, at least on the surface. But in another sense, it was all new. It was his conception of the place that stayed the same. All the water in the beaver pond from last year had evaporated or flowed away as it was replaced with fresh precipitation. The trees wore new bark from what he had seen last fall. The swamp grasses, mosses, and ferns were in the same place as their predecessors, but they were all new growth from the spring. The leaves on the ground were fresh from this year, and the top layer of soil now contained the remnants of leaves from the year before. I guess he thought, I recognize the patterns of this place rather than the specifics. Who then am I if all my cells are replaced every ten years? Is a whirlpool the same whirlpool when new water replaces the old? Didn't George Carlin have a bit about a radio station that moved its studio, got a new frequency and call letters, changed its programming, and hired new announcers? Was it the same radio station? At what point does it stop being one and start being the next? His train of thought was interrupted. He heard the slower leaf disturbance across the pond, more steady than the squirrel and punctuated by pauses every few seconds. Eric saw the deer when it dropped its head to feed. With the deer's attention diverted, Eric pulled up his binoculars. This was a young buck, maybe two or three and a half years old. It had brown antlers that faded to four white tips. As he looked, Eric heard more rustling just below him. He eased his head back from the binoculars because the buck was looking in his direction. Just below him was a small doe, working her way through the swamp grasses. He felt the adrenaline rise as soon as he saw the deer, but he breathed slowly and rode the feeling without letting it take over. The doe could smell something. She stomped her hoof and snorted. The buck watched her, but she looked around for the source of the smell. Ape body odor, wool, leather, and acid chemical smells all hit her nostrils, even if she didn't know the nylon backpack and boot soles were the source of the artificial scents. Wandered off to the west on semi-alert. The buck browsed in the grasses, his jaw working side to side, watching the doe angle away. As he followed her, the smells hit his nose. He looked at Eric just thirty feet away, but Eric stayed motionless, not blinking or breathing, lest the steam of his breath give him away. The buck looked for the doe. Eric reached for his camera, but the buck's head snapped back, catching him mid-motion. Even though Eric froze, the buck's tail stood up and he bounced away. Eric could tell the buck wasn't fearful. His interest was casual, and after fifty yards, he stopped to stare at Eric again. As the buck had started to bound away, Eric pulled up his rifle. He checked the safety and sighted in the buck as he turned broadside. Sensing no danger, the buck turned to follow the doe. Eric let out a whistle and the buck stopped again to look back, giving Eric another opportunity had he wanted it. This was the first hour of the first day of deer season, and Eric had decided to let this buck pass as soon as he saw it across the pond. The season was two weeks long. Eric thought, no sense in rushing it. It was, though, a chance to try getting in position. Practice doesn't make perfect, but it does make habitual. As the buck left his range of view, Eric's thoughts turned to his friends and their aversion to his hunting. He had felt uncomfortable about it in his liberal social circles, and now among the deep greens. Most of them were meat eaters, albeit organic pasture-raised, grass-fed, hormone-free meat eaters. He had at first tried humor. You think they tickle your hamburger to death? But that had not worked. The best strategy he had found to justify his hunting was to ask what attributes they thought exemplified ethical meat consumption. Most mentioned quality of life issues, treating the animal with respect, feeding it a species-appropriate diet, and avoiding artificial hormones and antibiotics as a standard practice. Many mentioned a quick death and sanitary butching conditions. Eric then pointed out how any deer's life far surpassed a cow's in both length and quality. It was free to eat acorns, clover, and scrub, not to mention its lack of chemical or medical adjuncts. But how can you kill an innocent deer, some would ask. It isn't done lightly, and I don't enjoy it, he would respond. But if I'm going to eat meat, I think it shows respect to the animal if I'm willing to take responsibility for my choice. 
I avoid chancy shots and most of my deer die in less than five seconds. I dress the deer out, skin it, butcher it, and then eat it over the next year. It allows me to avoid buying industrial meat, meaning I don't contribute to the environmental degradation, emergence of MRSA, or the diminution of quality of life in cows, pigs, chickens, or others endemic to the modern meat industry. He didn't want to shame anyone or pretend to be holier than thou. The effortlessness of buying meat at the grocery store and the sanitizing of death, though, made it easy for others to feel superior to someone who thought and felt deeply about what he ate, someone who was willing to face the truth behind his food. What had started out as embarrassment about how he grew up eating wild game had become a point of pride as he learned about the modern meat industry. End of chapter. Chapter 50, 3.4, Transportation. The degree to which we have become dependent on fossil fuels is less surprising in the transportation sector, as it is one of the few areas where the public directly interacts with oil. Over time, the industry has sought to hide our dependence on these energy sources by building refineries and power plants outside of cities and burying pipelines out of sight, but they cannot hide the black smoke coming out of tailpipes. We now understand more fully the systemic effects of using oil to move things around the globe on ourselves, other species, and the ecosystem as a whole. Instead, we should look to natural systems for their transportation solutions. In many cases, we have simple solutions to transportation needs that can replace the complicated systems on which we believe we rely. A quarter of the carbon emissions comes from the transportation sector, with personal vehicles accounting for half of that carbon. Note, U.S. EPA 2017. End of note. We need not write an indictment of fossil fuel emissions from the diminution of air quality to the increase in the atmosphere's greenhouse effect. That link is a clear and recognized danger. Note, Sims et al. 2014. End of note. When climate change and vehicle emissions are talked about in the media, discussions center on the negative effects for humans with only a secondary thought to what it does to other species or the ecosystem as a whole. And even then, it is in the light of how these changes affect humans. Humans and their ancestors have been traveling across the globe for nearly a million years, and the arrival in new locations altered the landscape and local ecosystem. For example, the first North Americans and Australians were novel threats to large mammals that had evolved without these two-legged spear-wielding predators. Even so, the methods of travel at this time, by foot or boat, were not disruptive. Fossil fuel power transportation does not take into account any organism other than human beings, and often is used to satisfy whims rather than needs. It's true that fossil fuels move us around the globe faster than at any time in human history, but it comes at a cost that we'll be paying back for thousands of years. Human, animal, and wind power can be harnessed for travel over the infrastructure that fossil fuel largesse have underwritten. Rail lines, road networks, and harbors can all be adapted to use new vehicles powered by renewable resources. We must learn to travel again with the means available to us in perpetuity, looking to successfully adapted organisms for inspiration. No species overuses their resources without suffering from hunger and population reduction. Humans have been using millions of years' worth of stored carbon energy every year. Imagine if wolf packs grew large enough to eat millions of times more caribou than were born in a year. How many years would they survive, even starting out with a world of billions of caribou? Indeed, we should model ourselves on the most successful organisms, which depend on abundant renewable resources. Fungi, for example, digest dead and decaying matter. Long after we run out of fossil fuels, the wind will blow across the ocean, Organisms tend to travel with purpose, and transporting items needlessly be will become a thing of the past as local alternatives become more attractive than the steep cost of long-distance travel. The more we can reduce the need to travel long distances, the more we can simplify our transportation solutions. The ease of stepping into a car and driving from point A to B masks a complicated world of extraction, refineries, pipelines, distribution infrastructure, vehicle production, and discard and emissions. This is exacerbated by our choice and fetishization of individual vehicles at the expense of shared solutions. Changing this culture will not be easy, but again we are between the proverbial fossil fuel rock and the hard place of getting along without them. Our ancestors survived with limited transportation. Building and city planning in a world without personal vehicles will bring back local communities where strangers now live side by side. Lightweight, high-value items were common trade goods before industrialization and will become so again after diesel is no longer available to send toilet paper across the country in two days. Using wind and water currents as well as mechanisms to convert human and animal kinetic energy into movement can take us into the distant future. We do not have to go back, but we can use advances in engineering, alloys, and the existing infrastructure to make new, innovative solutions to move across land and water. End of chapter. Chapter 51, Curbing Automobiles, Spring 2016. Thank you all for coming, said Andy Halverson, standing in a circle of people gathered in his basement. I've met with each of you one-on-one -on -one and started discussing a vague plan for changing the way Americans feel toward cars. Each one of you said you wanted to take real action to change your society for the better. Some of what we're going to talk about tonight will be considered illegal under current law. 
If you have second thoughts, you need to leave now. If you stay, at worst you will be implicated, but at best you'll be part of the movement that will radically alter our lives. Andy paused to look around the room, meeting the eyes of all twelve people. All but one looked back at him with expressions of determination. Mary, you don't have to stay. No, I want to be part of this, but I'm having a hard time committing to something before I know what it is. She brushed her bangs to the side and tucked them behind her ear nervously. I'm sorry about the cloak and dagger business. I've known most of you for years and would trust each of you with my life. I've been vague to protect the group and its goals as well as to shield you from potentially incriminating knowledge. I will tell you this. Whether or not we choose to act, a momentous change is coming, either through the unmitigated collapse of natural systems or protective steps that start right here and now. It'll be dangerous, but we're not in this alone. I can't say more unless you make the choice right now. He said all this while looking at the cracks in the cement floor, but he turned his eyes back to Mary. She bit her lip, tucked her hair again. Okay, I'm in. Andy looked at her for a moment longer before breaking into a smile. Great, let's get started. What I'm going to tell you cannot be repeated to anyone outside this room. Not your spouses, children, parents, friends, or the authorities. A movement is starting, and this movement will not only reorganize our nation, but reorder society. We will only play one small part in this movement, but like other groups, just like this one, we've been given tasks aimed at undermining key infrastructure and industries. We will not meet these others, nor will we know what they're doing. This compartmentalization protects everybody. We cannot inadvertently expose them, nor them us. But they're out there, and we're all working towards the same goal. None of this information can be sent electronically. That means no texts, phone calls, or emails about this. Don't even write anything down. Don't write anything in your datebook or calendar. We even have to plan these meetings by word-of-mouth communication. I asked you all to leave your phones at home because of their GPS and built-in microphones. Don't bother bringing them when we meet. Most surveillance is now electronic, so we've got to avoid anything that could give us away. We've been tasked with what is called Operation Hercules. The name is supposed to evoke the labors that he carried out. It might not be a great name, but we had to call it something. Our goal is to change Americans' entrenched feelings towards automobiles. Since the beginning of the industry, bigger, faster, and more powerful vehicles have been fetishized. Instead of seeing an SUV or sports car as wasteful, extravagant, and dangerous, they are perceived as status symbols. Convincing Americans to give up their vehicles will require a colossal bit of psychological warfare, and we'll have to start gradually. The first step is an underground PR campaign. We'll be plastering gas-guzzling SUVs and other vehicles with embarrassing bumper stickers. What I want to do tonight is brainstorm ideas. Next week we'll print them, I'll send them out across the country, and we'll also put some out here. Bumper stickers? Mary was crestfallen. You're talking about these grand things, getting rid of cars, changing society, but bumper stickers? That's for today. It's the thin edge of the wedge. It starts the crack, and then we make it wider with increasingly big actions. Don't worry. What's after bumper stickers, then? I can't go into details, but next we'll be undermining the public confidence in fuel supplies. Andy grinned. It'll be fun. Over the next half hour, the team brainstormed slogans. I heart OPEC. Blood for oil. Spill, baby, spill. My other car also wastes gas. Support corporate welfare to keep gas cheap. Save the oil rigs. Life's short. Waste gas. My truck runs on arrogance and lots of gas. Who needs polar bears anyway? I'll be dead soon. My pollution is your problem. I keep it idling all night. And thank you for your service to keep gas cheap. Headline. SUVs, trucks, and other vehicles targeted in nationwide prank. May 5th, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. Across the country this week, stickers appeared on the bumpers of SUVs, trucks, and other large vehicles with poor gas mileage. The stickers, which have been plastered on vehicles in Los Angeles, Chicago, St. Louis, Dallas, Atlanta, New York, Boston, and a dozen other smaller cities, had slogans suggesting the vehicle's owners held antisocial views on the environment and the military. Thousands of vehicles have been targeted, and spotting these stickers has become a viral sensation under the hashtag GasHole, with millions of views on social media websites. The fact that these identical stickers appeared across this country within a span of a few days suggests a large network of individuals taking part in this activity, according to the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Special Agent James Engelhoff, who has been put in charge of this case. The FBI assumed jurisdiction because of the interstate nature of this crime, which they are characterizing as criminal vandalism and conspiracy. The FBI's job has become increasingly difficult, however, as within a few days, copycat stickers were being sold online and began showing up on bumpers. Most vehicle owners appearing in the news across the country are upset by the prank. Videos of sticker removals have become commonplace on social media, with drivers stating how upset they are that they don't agree with the sentiments of the stickers, such as blood for oil or spill baby spill. A few drivers have expressed indifference or even appreciation of the messages plastered on their vehicles, but the reaction on social media has been harsh and swift, causing some to delete their accounts to avoid abuse. End of article. In the waning hours of the morning on Friday, May 27th, a panel van pulled up next to a Hummer parked on a side street in Chicago. The van's door slid open on oiled tracks. The gas flap and cap were opened, and the hose was fed into the tank. 
A vacuum-pumped word and four gallons of gas were drawn out before the hose was pulled. Then the nozzle from a modified dump can, the kind used to refill NASCAR racers, suspended from the van's ceiling, was inserted into the tank and four gallons of diesel flowed into the tank. The nozzle was pulled back into the van, the cap flapped shut, and the van glided away. The whole thing took less than 30 seconds. Inside the van, Andy consulted his clipboard. Okay, next we're going to Wolcott Avenue. There's a red Dodge Neon that filled up this evening. Mary sat on the passenger's seat and consulted a map. Three blocks up, then make a left. Should be parked on the right. I feel kind of bad doing this to cars. I mean, I could care less about the Hummer, but the Neon probably just takes some minimum wage worker to her job. I know, but it has to seem like the gas station has contaminated fuel. It's really the only way. Someone would notice if we just did it to the gas guzzlers. Earlier that day, Andy's team had tracked two dozen vehicles that had filled up at the nearby BP gas station. They followed them home and noted on a map where the street parked vehicles were. How bad will it be? Enough to send all these vehicles to the mechanic, or at least have them get towed there. We're mixing out about 20% diesel, so that should be a catastrophic failure to the pistons and rods since the octane rating will drop. Headline. Country's gas station sabotaged by eco-terrorists ahead of Memorial Day weekend. May 28, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. A group calling themselves the eco Gorillas has claimed responsibility for sabotaging gas stations across the country this week. Just ahead of one of the biggest travel weekends of the year, Memorial Day falls on Monday. This group, designated as terrorists by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has mixed diesel and gasoline supplies affecting fuel stations in Los Angeles, Chicago, St. Louis, Dallas, and New York at the time of printing. Hundreds of cars in each city have reportedly suffered engine damage, as gasoline engines cannot cope with the lower octane of diesel fuel. The FBI has begun an investigation of this coordinated attack on our nation's fuel infrastructure. Special Agent James Engelhoff spoke at a news conference yesterday, confirming the attribution of this attack to the eco-radicals. Quote, This unprecedented and unprovoked attack against our gas stations was specifically orchestrated to inconvenience the maximum number of families ahead of Memorial Day holiday. While we are investigating this attack and will arrest the culprits, we encourage everyone to go about their holiday plans and enjoy themselves, as this is the opposite of what these environmental terrorists want. End quote. The eco-gorillas, who gained notoriety last fall for terrorizing mining aid executives as well as campers at Yellowstone National Park, released a statement indicating that they targeted gas supplies across the country, and anyone filling up this weekend was playing Russian roulette with their vehicle's engine. They contradicted the FBI's statement of their intent, however, urging people to, quote, enjoy the great outdoors this weekend, but to do it without using fossil fuels, end quote. Headline, Gas Station Supply Attack, a Hoax, June 6, 2016. Chicago, Wired News Agency. Last week, a group of radical environmentalists claimed to have sabotaged the nation's gasoline supply with diesel. Over a thousand cars across the country were damaged through diesel contamination ahead of the Memorial Day weekend. Communiques from the group claimed that they had added the diesel before the gas reached the stations, but it now appears that all the damaged cars were parked on the street or in publicly accessible locations and the diesel was added to the cars themselves. The attack was sophisticated and well thought out, according to the Federal Bureau of Investigation Special Agent James Engelhoff, who noted that the vehicles in any of the affected clusters had all filled up at the same gas station, giving the appearance of being a problem in the gas supply. Quote, These people are not just acting on a whim. This is a coordinated ring of conspirators. It must have taken significant manpower to track the vehicles as they filled up, follow them to their parking spots, and then come back and put diesel in the tanks of between 25 and 75 vehicles o- over a dozen locations nationally. The attack precipitated a volatile week in the gasoline industry. What was expected to be a busy Memorial Day travel weekend turned out to be the worst in modern history. Fewer cars were on the road over this holiday than any previous Memorial Day weekend on record, and gas sales fell to level not seen since the 1973 oil crisis. The hoaxers targeted name-brand gasoline stations, and many of them closed to test their gasoline. The stations responded quickly when tests confirmed that no diesel was present in the gasoline supplies, but when even the stations that were thought to be the source of the contaminated gasoline came back with clean results, public trust fell, and many decided not to risk filling up. Independent gas stations were spared, however, as damaged vehicles could only be linked to stations with major brand affiliations. The other stations, realizing the market opportunity, raised their gas prices, in many cases doubling or tripling the cost of gas from the national average, covering around three fifty per gallon, to over $10. Even with these prices, cars in many cities lined up for blocks, but demand outstripped supply and many independent stations' tanks ran dry, as approximately half of the nation's gas supplies were left unused at brand-name stations. End of article. It was a month later, in the early morning hours of Friday, July 1st, when a panel van pulled up to the air compressor at a BP gas station in St. Louis. The vehicle was parked over the access hatch for the gas station's supply tank. Only the side of the van was visible to the security camera and the license plate were covered by thin plastic covers that obscured the plate for anyone not looking the plate straight on. The driver got out, and in no hurry, fed quarters into the machine and started to fill his tires. Inside the van, three people were working fast. A hatch in the bottom of the van was opened. 
One person used a cordless drill to back the bolts off the fuel tank caps. One for adding fuel, the other for capturing the vapors from the tank back into the fuel truck. The interior caps were pulled, exposing a filling tube under one and a spring-loaded vapor lock on the next. The others in the van jumped into action. One secured a nozzle to accept the vapors, and the other slid a three-inch flexible tube into place on the filling pipe. The next person was now back at the IBC totes, 330-gallon plastic tanks, turning the ball valve to let the heating oil flow. At about four gallons per second, it took just under three minutes to empty the two totes of their payload. A pressure tank was plumbed into the totes with a regulator maintaining 20 pounds per square inch to speed up the flow. As the tanks emptied, the van rose on its shocks, which had been overloaded with 4,500 pounds of fuel, a few hundred pounds over its listed capacity. The team had been keeping tabs on the gas station. They knew that the supply of regular gasoline, a 12,000-gallon stainless steel cylinder buried beneath the station, had been refilled three days earlier and should be about half empty. By adding 660 gallons of heating oil, which is essentially diesel but easier to buy in large quantities and tax-free to boot, the octane level had been lowered by about 10% enough to wreak havoc on most engines. The driver heard tapping on the side of the van. He returned the air hose to the hook and got back in his van, pulling away to refill their tanks and get more stations before the first light. Headline, Gas Station Supplies Sabotage, Tens of Thousands of Vehicles Damaged on Holiday Weekend, July 3, 2016. Chicago, Wired News Agency. Following on the heels of last month's gas supply hoax, when hundreds of cars across the country had been damaged as diesel was added to their gas tanks in an effort to convince drivers that the fuel supply had been contaminated, it appears that this attack has just taken place. Over 100 gas stations have reported that diesel fuel has been added to their regular gasoline supply tanks. The hoax targeted brand name gas stations, but this attack appears to be indiscriminate, affecting gas stations of all sizes and ownership. The attack came without warning, just before another one of the biggest travel weekends of the year, as people across the country celebrate the 4th of July. Because the holiday falls on a Monday this year, it was expected that more Americans would be traveling by car for the long weekend than in previous years. The Memorial Day hoax caused a spike in gas prices, long lines at independent stations, and a drastic reduction of travel. It appears that this attack was designed to damage vehicles instead of merely inconveniencing travelers. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has tied this attack to the Memorial Day hoax and the rash of vandalism earlier this year, where bumper stickers with anti-environmental and anti-social messages were attached to large, gas-intensive vehicles. Quote, This appears to be a coordinated effort to undermine our infrastructure system and even our way of life, said Special Agent James Engelhoff, who is in charge of this growing investigation. The FBI has identified the radical environmentalist group known as the eco Gorillas as responsible for the bumper stickers and hoax, and although they have not been directly named as responsible for the latest attacks, it seems that likely that this group is connected with it. The FBI has opened a hotline for tips, 800-225-5324, and urges anyone with information to come forward immediately. After two months of investigation, the FBI has not made any arrests. Although Agent Engelhoff stated at a press conference two weeks ago that his team is making good progress in tracking down and apprehending those responsible for the hoax, no information as to the state of the investigation was made public. A source within the team, speaking on the condition of anonymity, said that Agent Engelhoff is, quote-unquote, losing it because of the lack of physical evidence for such a wide-ranging conspiracy, and that the investigation team's cohesiveness is fraying due to public outcry over the lack of tangible results. End of article. Andy and Mary drove down Interstate 40 through downtown St. Louis at 5.15 p.m. on the hottest day in July. They were coming up on the King's Highway interchange, which is constantly backed up during rush hour. The entering traffic tried to merge, slowing down the right lane back under the overpass to the off-ramp. Mary had her phone out and was recording, careful not to show Andy or her face. I don't believe this guy, said Andy from the driver's seat. What is it? Some jackass in a Suburban driving down the breakdown lane to exit. I'm sick of these arrogant SUV drivers thinking they can do what they want. Their car glided halfway into the shoulder, blocking the tan vehicle. Mary swung her camera back in time to catch the driver banging on his steering wheel and raising his middle finger. Do you think this is a good idea? What if he rams us? Somebody has to stand up to them. They drive like maniacs. Their big vehicles kill more in accidents, and they destroy the environment. I'm tired of just watching them. It's up to everyone to stop them. I wish he had gotten some of that diesel in his gas tank. Mary's laugh was cut short as the SUV revved its engine and jerked forward, slamming into the back of their car. They both yelled in surprise. They had been pushed far enough forward that the suburban driver could get by, but the side of his vehicle scraped against theirs just as the windows came side by side. What do you think you're doing, you little shits? yelled the driver, a middle-aged white guy with a baseball cap, mustache, and aviator sunglasses. What gives you the right to hit our car? Are you nuts? Gives me the right? Who made you the police? You don't get to get in my way just because you're jealous. Of what, your gas-cuzzling death trap or your attitude? It's people like you that are ruining the driving for the rest of us. I bet you got one of those bumper stickers about being an asshole and left it on. And this SUV means I get the right away. The Suburban's tires squealed as he pulled past Andy and Mary's car, stopping a few car lengths ahead of them. They saw the white taillights before the vehicle lunged back toward their car, buckling their hood up as it plowed into them. 
That's what you get for not getting out of my way. The tires squealed again, and Mary stopped recording. A minute later, the driver walked up to Andy's window. Are you guys okay? Andy? Mary? I didn't back up too hard, did I? No, it was perfect. This poor car. Oh well, it'll be worth it. You looked really pissed. The driver pulled off his hat, swept his hand across his middle, and took a theatrical bow. Standing back up, he raised his hand, looking up toward the sky. Acting! Headline. Large vehicles harassed across country as road rage incidents rise. July 25th, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. Last week's viral video of an SUV driver ramming another car is becoming cited as the source of a rash of incidents across the country. In the video, now viewed over 30 million times in the last three days on YouTube, the driver of a tan SUV repeatedly rams a compact car that blocked its way in the breakdown lane. The driver of the car, citing his growing agitation with large gas-guzzling vehicles and their drivers acting like quote-unquote maniacs. Shortly after this video went viral, copycats began posting their own acts of vehicular harassment against larger vehicles. Many drivers use their cars to block other motorists from breaking minor traffic rules or customs. In one video, a Lexus SUV cuts ahead of other cars waiting in line at a highway on-ramp when the car ahead of the vehicle stops and the driver exits the vehicle and deflates one of the SUV's tires before getting back in her car and driving away. Another popular video begins as an altercation between a driver and a bicyclist is already in progress. The driver of the vehicle brandishes a tire iron, swinging it at the bicyclist and missing, shattering his own car's driver's side window as onlookers clap and taunt the irate driver. The hashtag GasHole continues to trend on social media attached to photos, videos, and stories of problem drivers, many of whom have been identified by name by users on dedicated Reddit pages. Police have reacted differently across the country. While all law enforcement agencies warn against vigilante justice and citizens putting themselves in harm's way, some videos show officers ticketing the offending drivers and letting the activists go with a warning. Few industry representatives would respond to repeated requests for comment, but one regional dealership executive, speaking on the condition of anonymity, said that they identified a drop in SUV sales last week, but cautioned that this was too short a time to indicate a trend. He further noted that salespeople had given him anecdotal reports about customers citing the videos as one reason why they were less interested in larger vehicles. End of chapter. End of episode X. <laughs> End of episode 21 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. Why don't I leave that in there to show you that I'm a real person and I make all kinds of mistakes. 